Hey, it's Mike here, and today my response to the scientific report and all of the news articles saying that intermittent fasting is linked to nearly twice the heart disease death risk. In particular, that eating within an eight hour or less window was linked to plus 91% risk of cardiovascular mortality. Now the news reports went insane with this, but I also think that people have swung almost too far in the other direction saying this is absolutely fake. Some people even saying this is a conspiracy by the pharmaceutical company to make you not eat healthy. And at first I was like, yeah, these results don't really match up with the data, but then I was like, wait, there are a few different lines of scientific research and studies out there that say, hey, there actually is a good reason for this from multiple angles, which we will cover. And it's been like six years since I did my original intermittent fasting video, so let's just get into it. I do consider myself pretty neutral on this topic. I'm just interested in finding out what is healthy here. You know, people can intermittent fast on any type of diet. And that previous video I mentioned really was a sort of pros and cons, because I believe that there is a negative and positive to it as well. And in terms of the backlash to this report, which we'll cover in detail, I understand the sentiment. We've seen many trials, various studies saying, hey, we're seeing some good benefits with intermittent fasting in terms of like blood glucose and maybe some weight loss. However, as I've covered before, there's also a flip side in some of the studies showing not great things. We've also seen testosterone lowered in men. So was this study done by some massive pharmaceutical conglomerate? Well, no, it was actually funded by the National Science Foundation of China, by researchers in China, as well as Northwestern and Harvard. And as a shock to the conspiracy theorists who didn't actually read the abstract and their hypothesis, they thought that eight hour time restricted eating would be associated with a lower risk of all cause and cause specific mortality, whoops. So it appears that the researchers were expecting a positive result as well. And I just need to mention really quickly, intermittent fasting, of course, has a few different ways it can be done. It can be alternate day eating. And in this case, again, time restricted eating is referring to just eating within a window. You know, most people are eating within like a 10 to 14 hour window, but then you can go eight to 10 or less than eight. And some people go all the way down to one meal a day. Now the researchers echo their positive thinking by saying, quote, most short-term randomized control trials reported that eight hour time restricted eating improved cardiometabolic risk profiles. However, whether eight hour time restricted eating is associated with long-term hard endpoints remains unknown. That's why they were doing the study. And so let's look at this study and I say it in quotes because as many people have criticized, this is a non-peer reviewed abstract of research that was presented and that was at the American Heart Association's epidemiology and prevention session very recently. So on that alone, some people are just dismissing it, but I'm saying, wait a second, there's some other stuff we need to look at. But in terms of what this study did actually cover, it looked at different time eating windows with eight or less at the lowest, eight to 10, 10 to 12, 12 to 16, which was considered the norm and greater than 16 which would include that one hilarious lady that gets up in the middle of the night and like makes sandwiches and stuff. <laughs> Come back. Oh, I think they're legs. And there's no indication that this is super shoddy science. Like they still adjusted for a ton of things such as smoking, race, energy intake, junk food with a diet quality score and BMI and more. And right off the bat, we have some results that I haven't seen talked about as much, like some non-results, including what we see with all-cause mortality. Well, it trended at 26% higher for people eating within a less than eight hour window. It was not statistically significant, however, still not in the right direction there. And here's our main cardiovascular disease mortality chart. And it doesn't look that bad, but really the scale is compressed. That right there is about a two times death risk. And we see an even stronger over two times risk for people with known cardiovascular disease and for people with cancer, that went up to three times the heart disease mortality risk, which I think is notable considering I didn't hear that in the headlines. And I was actually surprised by the results for greater than 16 hours for an eating window because you, you would think this is horrible. You're pumping your glucose up and down all day long, stressing your metabolism, maybe eating even more calories because you're eating for longer. But you know, in certain cases, we see that it helped like for lower cancer mortality at least. So if I eat for 24 hours a day, do I just fully escape cancer and become immortal? <laughs> Not quite looking at other areas. We see a increased risk, but it isn't statistically significant, but that is worth mentioning. 
Now, I've watched a few videos on this and we've seen many criticisms, in particular, some very valid criticisms by those like Dr. Ids and Nutrition Made Simple. And one of the major criticisms is that this isn't even a study on people who were trying to intermittent fast. This was survey data from N. Haynes from 2003 to 2018. Part of that intermittent fasting wasn't even like a known thing. So this was just accidental time restricted eating. And while I do agree for a good section of that, that was the case. I feel like toward the latter end of that, quite a few people probably were doing time restricted eating on purpose. I mean, my video that I made was in 2018 after it had already become somewhat popular. But in terms of this notion that it was accidental intermittent fasting, part of me is like, that's a flaw. Part of me is like, that could be a benefit because as a lot of people People are trying to intermittent fast they're trying to make a bunch of health changes at once and some of those benefits could be conflated so this is a way of getting people that are not within the ideology of intermittent fasting per se but does your metabolism know the difference if you are trying to intermittent fast within an ideology or if you just happen to be intermittent fasting but then this brings me to another criticism is who are the type of people that would be checking that box on this NHANE survey that they're eating within a less than eight hour window. And that's a criticism by Nutrition Made Simple saying, hey, it could be that these are people with really stressful jobs, you know, people maybe in the medical field, et cetera. And while it's true, they probably aren't eating on a normal schedule. I would just completely flip the script and say, hey, those people might be more likely to eat within that 16 plus hour window where they can just eat whenever they can. And maybe that's eating at 2 a.m. and then again at like midnight that same day, <laughs> like, I don't know. And this video is sponsored by Compliment and their Compliment Essential Multivitamin, which I'm super happy about because it's designed to be preventing any of those nutritional shortcomings that people often complain about on a vegan diet or even quit a vegan diet for. They put so much in one capsule, which is why I had to joke that it is one pill to rule them all in a recent short, which I had too much fun with. But unlike the one ring, it doesn't turn you invisible and attract ring wraiths, right? Crap. Ah, the ex-vegan ring wraiths are coming, like Miley Cyrus and other ones telling me that I need to eat fish for omega-3s. Miley, fish get their long chain omegas from algae. You don't need to eat fish. Whoa. And yeah, Complement has your classic vitamin D and B12, and it has a good balanced amount of selenium and iodine, which I know many people are concerned about, but it's the first one that I've seen, the first multivitamin that has DHA and EPA in it as well which various plant-based doctors like Gregor say you should get daily. And I have to say, this is a case where I was individually buying things that are in this. I had my B12 supplement, I had my separate D supplement and my separate algae-based omega supplement, and it was uh, cranking up higher than this cost. So if you do wanna try Compliment Essential, you can of course click the link below and use the code MIKE15, that's M-I-C-15 for 15% off your order, all right. All right, now that we've looked at some of the potential flaws of the study, let's look at what could actually be backing it up in terms of data elsewhere. And we can just imagine for a second, 10 years have passed, this study has been published and it seems legit. And we've had a few more things repeated, meta-analysis maybe out there. Okay, what is the mechanism? A couple things happening, the first of which I would deem my heavy meal theory. I mean, most of these people, they're Americans, they're eating a standard American diet. And what they're doing is compressing what they are eating. And even if that means a marginally lower amount of calories consumed, they're still gonna be eating quite large amounts of saturated fat, cholesterol, et cetera, in a shorter period of time as a heavy meal. And while the study did adjust for diet quality, I think we can have a situation where the quality of the diet can actually be the same between different time restricted eating groups or unrestricted groups, but that same food can do more damage in a shorter window. When we're thinking about postprandial or after meal spikes, yeah, you know, having less meals, eating within, you know, eight hours and not eating for 16 hours of the day, then we might be having less blood sugar spikes. But if you are slamming a bunch of cholesterol and saturated fat, you know, we can get a postprandial cholesterol spike, which can lead to various issues like endothelial dysfunction or artery wall dysfunction. And we'll talk more about the potential actual effects, but it is clear that after heavy meals, for example, during holiday meals, we see an increased risk of heart disease death. And let's say somebody is even eating 3000 calories a day normally, maybe they're able to cut out 500 with this while still slamming 2,500 calories of the same type of food 
in just eight hours versus maybe 14 hours, you can see what would happen to the pipes in our body. And I would go as far as to say that in some cases, this could be mimicking a binge eating disorder in the sense that people are slamming down a whole bunch of food at once. In particular, one meal a day or OMAD, where people are trying to sometimes eat a 2000 calorie meal, boom, that is not gonna be nice on your system. And this Redditor asks r slash intermittent fasting, how does one eat 2000 calories in one meal? People respond with, you know, eat more calorie dense foods with one saying steak with butter as an answer. You see where I'm going with this. And yeah, the eating disorder bulimia, which is binging and purging. So it is a bit different, but still from this study, notably it's associated with a 22 times risk of heart attack at two years and 14 times at five years, citing the higher calorie intake in short periods and how it is atherogenic. And we have some more specific data on heart attacks and heavy meal consumption. One study found that the risk of heart attack increased tenfold in the first hour following the oversized meal, reduced to about fourfold by the second and was essentially gone by three hours later. And that's looking at people who had heart attacks and what meals they ate when, oversized or heavy versus normal. But I will say this was once again, just one of those freaking scientific reports that an American Heart Association conference or whatever. How about you stop doing that? How about you just crank the study out? How much harder is it? But thankfully we have similar data that was actually published from this study saying the relative risk of acute coronary event during the first hour after a heavy meal ingestion was seven times as much, 700%. And the authors go as far as to say that a heavy meal can actually trigger the onset of an acute coronary event and that education of the population to avoid heavy meals, especially in people at risk of heart disease, should be emphasized. Yes, you have researchers literally telling you not to eat heavy meals and this eight hour window is absolutely encouraging heavy meal consumption. And in terms of mechanisms, again, back to this Science Daily article on the previous study, say that a high fat meal impairs the function of the endothelium, the inner lining of the arteries, by a direct effect of fatty acids and other fats in the bloodstream. And this is a point where I have to say, of course you don't have to eat a high fat intermittent fasting diet. I just have to say, I think that's how most people are doing it, especially coming from a standard American diet or following a low carb diet, which I'll mention in a second. And from the director of preventative cardiology at UC California, Irvine Health, they say, quote, when you eat a lot of food at once, the stomach expands and the body shifts blood from the heart to the digestive system. In people who already have blockages in the heart arteries, any shunting of blood away from the heart can result in angina or chest pain. And then I would go ahead and say more issues. And additionally, that a distended stomach can lead to irregular rhythms. I'm assuming pushing on the heart directly which can produce a heart attack or heart failure after a heavy meal. And this is where the study might also have a connection to low carb eating, though this is again, just speculation, because we have seen quite a bit of a pairing between intermittent fasting and low carb or ketogenic diets. I mean, Atkins has a whole page about intermittent fasting on a low carb diet and from a 2018 Healthline article, quote, the keto diet and intermittent fasting are two of the hottest current health trends. They talk about combining them and that it might help with greater fat loss, et cetera, but that some people should avoid it. And multiple studies have encouraged it, like this one saying that a low carb pattern along with intermittent fasting may help individuals with insulin resistance. And this one saying that intermittent fasting and keto can synergistically work for many disorders. But I need to remind people once again from a meta-analysis like this one that low carb diets are associated with 30% increased all-cause mortality, and it's probably connected to the higher LDL cholesterol, etc. Then we have the second area that supports this, which brings me to Nutrition Made Simple, mentioning that, hey, we have quite a bit of data on skipping breakfast that does not look good, in particular a study using the same NHANES data that found a very similar plus 90% cardiovascular mortality in those that skipped breakfast. This is a little bit looser of a connection, but it's also not looking good. Yeah, if you skip breakfast and then you just eat lunch and dinner, then yeah, it's likely that you're gonna be eating within an eight hour window. Yeah, if you're eating super late, then forget that. And that's why people are like, hey, this is connected to alcoholism, that could be it. But get this, from the main study that we were talking about, it appears that the less than eight hour window people had the lowest alcohol consumption of any time window. Further support this from a 2017 Journal of the American Cartage, 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 
from a 2017 Journal of the American College of Cardiology study, quote, atherosclerosis was observed more frequently among participants who skipped breakfast. They say that, well, these people are generally trying to lose weight, just like somebody who is doing intermittent fasting would. They end up eating more or heavier foods later in the day. And that skipping breakfast can cause hormonal imbalances and alter circadian rhythms. But yeah, it makes total sense that people who skip breakfast, they have a calorie deficit being awake already for part of the day, and then their body goes, give me the most calorie dense food possible to make up for that energy I just burned being awake, and then they might reach for those higher fat foods that can impair artery function, etc. And yeah, from this Korean study, it appears that people who skip breakfast go for higher fat foods later in the day, actually eating a higher percentage of fat in terms of total calories. And how does this affect heart disease risk factors like LDL or bad cholesterol? Well, from this meta-analysis from 2023, which included many randomized control trials, found that skipping breakfast, while associated with slightly lower BMI, was associated with higher LDL, like 10 points higher. However, I will say the results are mixed for LDL on deliberate intermittent fasting studies, and some of that could just be eating less calories, but this is interesting. And then finally, we have this meta-analysis that looked at our NHANE stuff and then also added some more US survey data from other sources as well as some Japanese sources. And we see that yes, skipping breakfast is associated with increased cardiovascular and all cause mortality. Yet as this study says, the case remains unsolved. So there are a couple explanations and I have a third one, which is, it's a little tenuous, a little a bit of a stretch here, but the idea that the microbiome is involved, I can't help but think that, you know, our gut wants to have a constant source of things like fiber and fuel. And as you have a constant source of fiber, you're creating these beneficial things like short chain fatty acids and other metabolites that lower inflammation, which could technically lower heart disease risk. So if you compare people that are eating like 12 hours a day, to those who are eating eight or less, you think about the total amount of fiber feeding of that bacteria that is going on, and you're slicing a pretty big chunk out of that, which could have an effect on risk. But I can't help but think that this is people eating a standard American diet in the US, people are eating like 15 grams of fiber on average, so would it really matter that much? But hey, you know, spreading out that 15 grams of fiber, you know, might make your bacteria happier, I don't know. In the end, yeah, this wasn't peer reviewed yet, which makes me frustrated, like why does the news have to go crazy and spread a bunch of stuff when there's so much peer reviewed research they don't care to report on? Anyway, yeah, there are some other valid criticisms as well. These people weren't purposely doing intermittent fasting based on the years of the survey. Does that have a different physiological effect? We don't know. It's also possible that these people were just eating this way because they have some stressful or, or wacky lifestyle that has other confounders. However, again, those people were consuming less alcohol. But we again have multiple lines of data showing that maybe this isn't good for your heart after all. Even if maybe it is good for something like diabetes, uh, heart disease is our number one killer. And looking to how holiday meals or heavy meals in general increase the risk of heart attack with various mechanisms proposed. As as well as how skipping breakfast is also really not looking good for cardiovascular mortality. There very likely is something more going on here. No, maybe there's an LDL aspect going on. Maybe there's an artery function aspect. Maybe it's connected to low carb. Maybe it's not. Maybe there's a circadian thing that's happening here. Either way, uh, I look forward to this being published and more research on this. So yeah, I wouldn't just completely dismiss this study as I've seen entire comment sections do. Like that is equally as irresponsible. Anyway, if you would like to be responsible, uh, you can of course click the link below and use the code MIC15, Mike15 for 15% off. Your order of compliment essential, which I'm super stoked about. Keep my life easier already. And of course you can let me know down below what you thought about this. There's probably some major point that I missed. So type that in the comments. And of course, feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.